College Football Nerds talking Texas A&M and LSU. This week, it's the game of the week in college football. And Josh, these are two teams who, if you talked to a college football fan a week or two after the start of the season, you wouldn't have this game circled. And now it's a game that is between two teams who both might end up in the top 10, especially the way that Texas A&M is playing lately and with LSU's resume to date. Um, talk a little bit about just, is it fair to judge A&M and, um, and LSU with their early season losses? Or is it a situation where, like we've seen in the past, where LSU has just gotten a lot better after that first week? And you, new staff, new things to learn, takes a few weeks to iron out the wrinkles, and now these teams are a lot better, and we should look at how they've been playing lately and not necessarily care so much about what they did at the beginning of the season. Everything has to matter, but certainly as you play better football, that starts factoring in and, and averaging things out. Look, a lot of teams around the country have lost inexplicable games. Alabama lost to Vandy, Notre Dame lost to Northern Illinois. Those are both probably good teams on the whole. Um, and I think to some degree, you know, a lot of how those early season losses are viewed kind of get skewed because of what those teams have done. Like Notre Dame is a good team. Notre Dame is quietly looking like they are probably going to be a playoff team. They lost an absolutely inexplicable game to Northern Illinois. And it's not because Northern Illinois is better than them. Every single computer analytic thing you want to look at says Northern Illinois is a terrible football team. It's not even about parity because again, parity says the bad teams have caught up to the good teams. Northern Illinois has not caught up to Notre Dame. It just seems like Freeman drops an inexplicable game every year. That does not mean that Texas A&M isn't good in a game that they lost very close to Notre Dame. Um, and if they lose close to a, a playoff team and then they go pummel Missouri, who's an expected playoff team, and they do well in the rest of their schedule and win by double digits repeatedly, isn't that sort of handling business? And, and I think you kind of have the same question with LSU because they lose that close game in the opener to USC – and since then, they've handled themselves well. They beat an uh, Ole Miss team that's still top five in our metrics, a South Carolina team that I think probably ought to be a top 25 team. Uh, at least they were a top 25 probably quality team. Uh, Arkansas, they demolish. I, I think they're getting held back because they lost that close game to USC. And it's not that USC isn't good. It's that USC has cl- quit, collapsed. I don't know what you want to say about it, right? They, they're... They are not playing anywhere close to their potential, and I think everybody knows that. It's it's not what USC was in week one. So, Daniel, I'd kind of spin it around a little bit and say with both these teams, they had that initial loss to a team that is majorly or, or minorly significantly disappointed, and that disappointment's kind of been unfairly cast over on A&M and LSU. Um, and so I think I view these games, and I view wins and losses. I say this all the time. I view your resume based on the quality rankings of your opponents, not their record and resume. You don't play in the game of you beat this team that went undefeated and you beat this team that's 3-2 and two or 3-4 and four in USC's case. You can't really play that game, which the AP, AP, AP poll does, because at the end of the day, I care about whether or not you're a good team, whether you won your games, and the fact that you're... You know, you went out there and you played a team that just laid multiple eggs and was playing like garbage for half the season and finally got their act together and played the kind of football they should have played. Um, And maybe you lost by one or maybe you won by five. I care that you played a team that played well in that game that was capable of playing well. And that's how we should evaluate teams on their records is, yes, you evaluate them on their record and their resume, but it's their resume based on the quality of their opponents, not the resume of their opponents. And I think that's the big thing that's held back uh, Texas A&M and LSU from a lot of the national discussions. Because, yes, those losses matter. But those were losses to teams that could be, should be very, very good. And that should keep you squarely in the playoff discussion if you treat them fairly. So we've talked coming into this season about sequencing being potentially a problem. Schedule sequencing meaning... You might play somebody in the third game of a four-game stretch of good teams. None of those four teams are better than you, but you drop that third game because it's just tough. It's tough to mentally get up week after week against a team that's good enough to beat somebody. You don't have that mental drop. You don't have a lot of buys. And we're we're in kind of the dog days of everybody's schedule, into the grind of everybody's schedule. And 
Right now, you've got LSU coming off of Ole Miss at home, Arkansas on the road. That Arkansas game is is a is a bit of a rivalry game, and Arkansas is not a terrible team. They won that game comfortably. Back to back road games for LSU, a team that does seem to play better at home. I know they just won big at Arkansas, but that Ole Miss game at home was big. South Carolina, they didn't look great on the road. Away from home versus USC, they didn't look great. Is there a situation here where you have to factor in in your mind who they've played the last couple, three weeks? Or is that such an ambiguous, nebulous thing that you just kind of look at these two teams straight up when you're looking to pick them? I think you have to consider schedules at a very heavy level right now because it's becoming really obvious that these conferences are not evenly loaded. And, you know, we had this whole discussion with Indiana. Um, Indiana has not played a top 40 team yet. Um, And in the SEC, 15 of 16 teams are top 40 teams. So, you know, even within the SEC, though, there's, I don't know how many, what quality top 10 teams are there. There's something like six. I mean, it's crazy. Um, And so, you know, whether or not you play those teams or other teams and and the quality of the defenses and everything else matters, I think, more almost than it ever did. And a lot of that is because we don't have divisions anymore. And so schedule disparity, meaning differences in scheduling, has become way more significant. Um, Texas A&M blew out Missouri. LSU won really close to Ole Miss. I kind of view those almost equal at this point, Daniel. I mean, Ole Miss, I think, is a much better team than Missouri right now. Um, Now, Texas A&M blew out Missouri, and so that kind of compensates for it. Um, Mississippi State was a team that is not a high-quality team, but they've been a completely different team since they put in Van Buren, and he's got some reps. They've just been completely different. In the Georgia game, Texas A&M came. They're they're a much more dangerous team than they were to start the year. Um, Even then, they're a team that almost beat Oklahoma State. We we like to ignore the the Arizona State-Oklahoma State things uh, for the past couple years. Uh, That never means anything when the SEC wins those games, or nearly does. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I do think it all matters – but I, I'm going to turn this around a little bit to you, Daniel, and say there's there's a lot of wackiness in that, too, statistically, um, on how it plays out. So right now, just looking at passing statistics in conference play, yards per attempt, Jackson Dart is you know leading the SEC in yards per attempt overall. But if you look at co- yards per attempt in conference play only, I mean, who would have guessed number one and number two in conference play has been Graham Mertz and Diego Pavia? And the last four qualifying are Nussmeyer, Hawkins, Brady Cook, and Vandegrift. Like it, it just it's upside down. And if and this is what's even wackier, and the reason I'm kind of bringing this up, if Connor Wegman qualified for that statistic, he's thrown for 10.5 yards per attempt in conference play. He would lead the SEC in yards per attempt, and Nussmeyer would be bottom four in conference play only. So, you know, I don't think any of that's actually true for who these teams are and who these players are. But it's really clear that scheduling and the quality of the opponents you face and the quality of defenses and the disparity between that and the conference is just having a tremendous impact on the way we view all of these football teams. And trying to sort that through in context is getting exceedingly difficult. I think our opponent-adjusted stuff helps a lot. But I also think there's a lot more eye test. And frankly, there's a lot more room for argument if you want to say whenever we do our picks that we're completely off base and that your team's great or that the other team's terrible. I mean, I don't know. I feel like I know le- at, at this point in the season, Daniel, I, I don't think I've ever felt like I knew less about who is good within the Southeastern Conference. You hear that, y'all? You don't even, even need to listen to us because we don't know what we're talking about either. Um, Josh, I think think that one of the surprising things for me if I'm going to raise a concern for a team in this game um, Garrett Nussmeyer to your point he's he's not got great numbers I ex- expected a lot more from a yards per attempt standpoint um, even struggled against Arkansas which I don't think Arkansas is a terrible defense by the way but it looks like they're having to do a lot through him and if the Connor Wegman, whatever he's worked out post-injury thing is real, like if that's not just a 
function of who he's played and those teams not being great at, at defending what he does, then you've got a bit of a concern if you're an LSU fan because LSU's past defense, looking at just yards per attempt, opponent adjusted, we've got them at 90th in our numbers. Um, just pure pure numbers, they're 93rd. Um, and then Texas A&M is, is kind of up there. I think they're around, they're around 35 or 40, which still isn't great. But if you look at like, if what we've seen so far from Wegman is real, at least post injury, he didn't look great against Notre Dame. Um, is that pass defense a cause for concern for LSU? Because what I've felt so far from LSU this year is, I've I came into this year expecting LSU to have to win games they won the the way they won last year, scoring a lot of points, and being not good at all in defense. But it's really been the flip of that in that. The defense has felt good. Maybe they're not as good. Their numbers aren't as good as they've felt. But felt good enough to win, and the offense has just been just good enough to win. Um, tell me, I just said a lot of stuff, but maybe just piggyback on that to get us into the model. Yeah, and you know, I'll start by saying that that is the way it feels, and it hasn't played out that way. But when you look, you know, go to collegefootballnerds.com, and you can look at our statistics, and we have these relative performance statistics for opponent, which are opponent-adjusted. LSU's 30th in points per game nationally right now, um, 82nd in total rushing yards, or 42nd in passing yards per attempt, 37th in rushing yards per attempt, all that stuff. Opponent adjusted, we have them 7th in the country in points per game, 3rd in the country in total yards per game, 2nd in the country in rush yards per attempt, 25th in passing yards per attempt. That 82nd rushing yard per game number goes down to 25th in the country. So the point being, they've played really, really good competition that's really challenged them in some ways that I think are unexpected. Um, and defensively, I mean, the stats are kind of what they are, which is interesting. They, they, they haven't played phenomenal offensive competition, kind of average competition, and so the stats are pretty well equal um, equal with, you know, whatever their overall rank is. And I will say the same is true for AM. I m I mean, they're like 58th in points per game, but we adjust them down to 30th. 31st in passing yard per attempt, we adjust them down to 19th. Um, and so when you get in the model, um, the model has this game predicted out to be 26 to 21 LSU over Texas A&M. Um, that's sitting there at six, about 6.1 yards per play for LSU, about 5.5 for A&M. Um, A&M has interestingly advantages in the passing game, about nine yards per attempt at LSU seven, flip it around in the run game. LSU is about 4.6 to 3.6. That all tracks with the statistics I just read off. To your point, it, you know, it feels like the rest of the team's actually carrying Nussmeyer more than the other way around. Now, we flagged that, Daniel, in the preseason. We flagged it coming out of last year and early this year when we did the preview of the LSU-USC game. Um, Garrett Nussmeyer, I think, is a very good passer, but he is not very mobile. And I think people severely underrated how much losing a 3,000-yard career rusher in Jane and Daniels was going to change the way that teams defended LSU. Teams are able to be much more aggressive with their pass rush because they don't have to worry about Jaden Daniels ripping off a 40-yard carry. And just at the end of the day, it's a lot easier to bring down in the pocket so you can be more aggressive and be more successful. And you don't have to spy and all this stuff. And it's clearly made Nussmeyer less effective, even though I think if you gave him Jaden Daniels' ability to run, I'm not sure he's not a better, pure thrower. But... Without those tools, everything else is made harder. The other team can drop more guys in the coverage, rush the passer with more because they don't spy. Um, and they've been able to pick up somewhat with the defense being greatly improved and then the run game being being pretty good. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you know, you talk about Texas A&M. They started the year really struggling offensively with Wegman. Um, and then, you know, he gets hurt, come back. He's been very effective since he came back from injury. Um, the run game hasn't necessarily been there. And the defense, you know, which was kind of viewed as probably being their strength, we got them in the, like, 20s, 30 range. Like, they're not really any better. They're pretty balanced offensively and defensively. So it is, yeah, it's, it's kind of confusing what, what these two teams are. Um, I will say, Daniel, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and lead in my pick, and then we can just have a discussion, okay? Um, you know, this game has it 20, 26... Uh, you know, 26-21 LSU over AM. I'm actually going to flip that. I'm going to say 27-21 LSU over Texas, or Texas A&M over LSU. And I will say the answer to that to me is, I think what we see from Connor Wegman, and I'm, I'm one that was 
I'm the one that put out the tweet and noted that in games versus what was it top 30 defenses, Connor Wigman has really never had a good game, ever in his whole career, really. Um, but I don't know that LSU's quite at that level. You know, especially again passing yard per attempt defense LSU opponent adjusted. We have them 90th nationally. They are they are good, pretty shockingly good run defense. Really, they are still quite bad in, in the pass game um, or in pass defense. So I think against that kind of a defense, that is an opportunity where Wegman is probably going to be able to be successful because I think he struggles when he has to really press to make things happen. And I don't think LSU is good enough to do that. And I think a and is going to play at a little bit of a higher level. But this starts getting into the reality of these teams is how do you do? How do you evaluate Wegman and who he is? How do you evaluate Musmire against this particular A&M team? Um, I don't know how many weapons A&M has offensively compared to, you know, the, the A-chain days or Evan Stewart has been really good at Oregon. Like there's a lot of question marks on that. And then LSU... Offensively, they got a lot of weapons. And, you know, this AM defense has not been phenomenal throughout the course of the year. They've been really good, but they haven't been absolutely locked down like we saw in the Mississippi State game. So, you know, is it underrating LSU to think that they're not going to put up 30 points in this game? I'm not sure. I, I'm, this is, this is maybe the hardest, the least comfortable I've felt picking a game all year because I don't know who these teams are. Like, you know, you look at, you talk about te- LSU's pass defense, and some of it is like they gave up almost eight yards per attempt to Garbers at UCLA. Um, the Sellers was pretty effective against them uh, before he went down. But they held Jackson Dart to 6.8 yards per attempt. And, and I just, so I, it's, I don't know what to think about LSU. Are you the team that beat an Ole Miss team that had a lot of momentum, or are you the team that lost to USC who couldn't beat Minnesota? I, it's it's really hard for me, and so I'm going with the home team. Um, A&M's not even getting getting the home team three point spread right now. They're they're two and a half right now uh, against LSU at home. I'm gonna go a little lower scoring than you. I'm gonna go twenty four. 20. Um, both of us have Texas a and covering, but I, 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 I have 0.0% confidence on this pick. And, and I mean, I picked Georgia to win, to beat Texas last week, and I had a lot more confidence with that than I do with this. Yeah, you know, we say this a lot, and it's, it's true. I had not looked at the point spread or the over-under when I did this pick. I was picking against the model, not really having a clue who was actually favored. Um, and it's interesting that A&M is favored despite the model. But they're favored by 2.5, and, and the over-under is at 53.5, which is darn near, what did I say, 27-21. So I got this at 48. I'm only five points off. Um, they got this just slightly higher scoring. Um it's right there. I mean, they're basically saying what, you know, more like 30 to 27 ish, 27 to 24, kind of. They're debating between those. You're almost picking between those two sets of numbers. Um, yeah, it is tough. Uh, it is tough to pick. I think it's interesting with what LSU's done and what AM's done, and I think the way they're perceived. Um, you know, AM is 14th with one loss, LSU's 8th with one loss. A&M is actually the favored team. Granted, they're at home, and it is basically a pick em, but they're not perceived to be as good. Um, it's interesting. I mean, the the Vegas is basically suggesting, all the stuff suggesting, they're probably about dead evenly matched teams. The one thing I will say, Daniel, A&M definitely, I think, has a better remaining schedule. <laughs> uh, well, I say better. I mean, they're maybe they're sort of equal. Um, South Carolina and Texas are really hard, but they still have New Carolina State and Auburn, and South Carolina is only so hard. LSU having to play A&M, then they play Alabama, then they play Florida, then they play Vanderbilt, then they play Oklahoma. That's a pretty rough stretch. Um, so I will say, however this game goes, both these teams have their work cut out for them the rest of the season, and that's good and bad because if either one of them runs the table from this point, they're probably going to be a top like top five team, maybe Daniel, top six team. Like they're obviously if they run the table, they're going to be in the SEC championship. Neither one of them has an SEC loss, and everybody else in the SEC does. So the whole door is wide open for them 
to go to the SEC title. Um, it's actually feasible for both these teams, Daniel. I don't know if you really thought about it. They could both play again in the SEC title. If they both won out, that would mean Texas A&M beat Texas. The only uh, other one on that slate would be Georgia, and you get into a weird tie, tie situation with Georgia. Um, but, you know, it, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I don't know if they're going to win out, and it wouldn't shock me if either one of them, like one of these teams ends up being 8-4. and four. Like, I, I don't know where in that spectrum it's going to land. I think that's a really fun thing to end the year, but I can't think of another year where we're going into November and I literally don't know if these are top five teams or if they're going to finish borderline unranked like that. Unranked. Like it really, either one can happen. Well, and it goes back to the scheduling sequencing issue we talked about because you reeled off what they have left, but that's after playing. So they've got Ole Miss at home and that was a grueling game. On the road, rivalry game, Arkansas. Another game on the road, A&M. Alabama at Florida, Vanderbilt, and then Oklahoma at the end of the year. That's, even with Oklahoma not being very good, um, that's a wild stretch where they might be favored individually against every one of those teams and could lose three of them. And, and, And it not really say a lot of bad about LSU. It's just that that's... There's, there's few teams outside of the SEC that have a road like that, you know, and, and everybody wants to kind of lump the SEC and the Big Ten in together. But I, I did the math last week, and it was there's a chance that four teams in the Big Ten finish either 11-1 and one or 12-0, and 0, and except for one team, um, all of them will have only played one ranked team and then all of the ranked teams that they would have played are within those four. Meaning Oregon, Indiana, Penn State, and Ohio State could all finish either 11-1 or 12-0. And on all of their resumes, the only ranked teams they would have played would be one of those four other three other teams. That's crazy. Like, that is crazy to me. Indiana, you talked about it. Like, they're I've got them high in my top, top 10, but they could finish the season with one ranked opponent, and that's Ohio State. They could go 11-1 lose their only ranked game, still make the playoffs and be a 30-point inferior team to somebody they play that belongs there. So this year is weird. I think that they've got to figure some stuff out with the SEC. You've probably got to add another game, a conference game because you can't have such schedule imbalance like Missouri has um, versus some of these. And... Uh, I don't know what you do like because everything is super isolated now. I guess we're all just playing for the playoffs at this point to where we can finally figure out who's good and who's not. Yeah, the to a point we made, we do a top 10 video. And if you haven't liked and subscribed us, if you found this conversation interesting, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. Um, but I talked about the fact that if you look at the Big Ten from FPI, which is probably the best overall power rating, we have our own, which I think is interesting, but it's totally on the field. We don't use other metrics. It's it's fun as a trend predictor, but I think FPI, just being wholly honest, is probably a better just absolute quality predictor. Um, the bottom half of the Big Ten would all be underdogs to Mississippi State, who's the worst team in the SEC. The bottom half of the Big Ten. There are 10 top 25 quality teams in the SEC. There's only six out of 18, only a third of the Big Ten. And what that means when you have 10 of 16 teams in the SEC that are top 25 it's really kind of hard to have an SEC schedule that's not that's easy. And it's possible if you catch four of those non-top 25 teams, which Missouri's kind of in that boat, that you can have an easier schedule. But it's also quite possible to have all tough teams, which I think a lot of the teams we're discussing right now do. But when you compare them to something like you're talking about, you know, with Indiana, Indiana has only played only played teams in that bottom half of the Big Ten. Everyone Indiana has played would be an underdog to Mississippi State. That is crazy to say, but according to FBI, every single team they've played would be an underdog to Mississippi State right now. It It is just bonkers to describe how ludicrously hard these SEC schedules are, but even in then, how, you know, with the fact that you've got currently uh, five of the top six in F- FBI are all SEC teams, how hard it can be which means the schedule disparity question just gets just gets really nuts. Um, yeah, I mean it's a it's a brutally hard conference this year, and 
you know, we'll see how it is for these two teams. But it, this really is the stretch stretch run of the gauntlet. I think they both know they've been preparing. They the A&M lost Wegman, got him back. Maybe it turns him into a different player. Uh, LSU's had to learn and grow. Every under Brian Kelly, they've gotten considerably better over the course of the season. I think that says a little bit about how they prepare in the offseason, but also says a lot about how well they coach during the season from a positive standpoint. Um, and both these teams have a chance to make a major run, so it's going to be interesting to see how they both do. Uh, and this really being week one of that stretch to see how it's going to turn out for both of them. All right, y'all, let us know what you think this game is going to look like. And if you think these teams, which one of these teams, if you had to pick one, to go on a run and make maybe, maybe make the SEC championship game, which one of these two would you pick? Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week, and God bless.